Mom, we're doing this for your own good. The woman's son spoke those words from the witness stand during a competency hearing. And he had been telling the judge about his mother's erratic behavior. She was up at all hours of the night. She did not seem to know night from day. She left water running and constantly neglected to turn off the burners on the kitchen stove. She wrote checks to total strangers that just showed up at her door. The time had come for the children to take charge, but she would have none of it. She fought her children all the way to the courthouse. When the hearing was over and the judge had left the courtroom, she turned to her friend who was sitting with her. My family hates me, she said. It seems that Jesus has been acting a bit strange of late. You don't go to collect your son if you think your son is doing well in your eyes. So Mary must have been thinking some of the same things that the people had been thinking. Some might suggest that Jesus' family came to gather him up because his family thought Jesus' actions and words were embarrassing or a blot on the family name. They could hear what the people were saying, and they were saying, he has gone out of his mind. But it is also just as likely that they are coming to take Jesus away because they loved him, and it was for his own good, not to protect themselves, but to protect Jesus from himself. Let's be honest. It seems that when you say some of the things that Jesus says and do some of the things that Jesus does, people might just think you're out of your mind. To paraphrase what C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was either who he said he was or he was a raving lunatic. He isn't just a good moral teacher. He isn't some idealistic historical figure that we can use in our political endeavors. Jesus is either the son of God or a raving lunatic. Seems that his family has chosen the latter. They arrive on the scene to collect him. Such a nice polite phrase, isn't isn't it? Collect him. For the people say that he has gone out of his mind. But which people? Which people are saying that? Did the crowd of people who showed up think that Jesus was just some carnival sideshow? Is that why they showed up? They showed up so that, that he couldn't even sit and enjoy a meal. Those are the ones saying that he's out of his mind. Or perhaps it's another group of people who have showed up called the scribes. And they showed up and were thinking that Jesus is out of his mind. And the scribes came from Jerusalem. It was a hundred mile trip to confront Jesus. And it seems that it was very important to them that they would confront Jesus that day. And the scribes traveled a hundred miles and go searching for Jesus and when they finally find him they confront him he has Beelzebul they accuse Jesus cast out demons by that authority and the scribes here accuse Jesus of using demonic authority to cast out demons it's a serious charge And it's a charge that, if true, would erode Jesus' influence with the people. It is a charge meant to turn the people against him. It is a charge to push back against Jesus' invictives, against the corruption that he sees in the hollowness of the scribes' religion, the religion that seems to put rules over people. And the scribes are saying, Of course he cast out demons. He's friends with them. And Jesus pushes back against that critique. He asked, how can Satan drive out Satan? How can a house divided against itself stand? How can a kingdom that is divided against itself stand? If Satan is opposing himself, how can he stand? And if that is the case, then his time is over. 
Jesus tells them then that this idea of a civil war among the demons is ridiculous. That Satan fighting with himself is just outrageous. And Jesus tells them that there is a war going on here, but it's not a civil war. Jesus is waging war, and it's a war against the evil powers of the world. And Jesus uses this unique image, one that I really never connected with me until this week. Jesus as a thief. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, when that strong man has been tied up, then the house can be plundered. Satan is the strong man, and Jesus is the thief that comes in and plunders the house. Jesus binds the strong man, binds Satan, and plunders the house. Satan even calls this world his own. It's one of the temptations of Jesus. Satan shows Jesus the entirety of the world and says, bow down to me and I will give you everything that you see. Just bow down and worship me. Jesus refuses. Instead of Jesus bowing down, we see Jesus binding the strong man of the house and plundering. I grew up in a church that had an enormous sanctuary. Enormous. It had 20-foot-tall stained glass windows lined all the way down its sanctuary walls. And depictions of biblical stories all along those stained glass windows. Plenty of real estate to imagine and put up there whatever biblical story you wanted. And not one of them depicted Jesus as a thief. We've got 20 stained glass windows in here lining the sides. No Jesus as thief depicted there. I've been in quite a few sanctuaries, and not one of those with a stained glass depiction of Jesus as a thief. And as jarring as it might be, I would love to see an artist rendition of Jesus as a thief. Jesus binds the strong man and plunders throughout the Gospels, forgiving sins Paralyzed men walking again, withered hands being stretched out to work again, plundering by including tax collectors and sinners in the fellowship of the saints, plundering by challenging the rigidity of laws that saw no room for mercy, casting out unclean spirits, breaking chains, and reforming the idea of who and what family is. Jesus goes to war with the evil forces of this world and it's only chapter 3 in Mark's gospel and the plundering has just begun. And it seems that the scribes are on the wrong side of the war. They are too worried about Jesus' teachings and what he's teaching and what that inclusion would mean for their hold on power. And so often they wonder like Nicodemus did, what does this mean? And if it means what we think it means, how can this be? And their chains are locked tight and they don't want the chains released because they don't see Jesus at work in the world as God's work. And how many times are we like the scribes? I mean, let's be honest here. Let's be real. We like God just the way we think God is. We like it when we know exactly how God works. If I do this, then God will do that. If I stay away from that, God will bless me. If I volunteer and do good things, well... There's a reward for me later in life. 
we like it when we can use a nice little formula, A plus B equals grace. And when that formula gets messed with, well, we can get agitated just like the scribes do. And we don't like that. We don't like it when we have to hear things like little formulas don't work to define how God works. We don't like to hear that we can't earn grace. We like the things the way they are. We like the way things are way too often in our own lives. And I mean, I like my status quo just the way it is because it really isn't that bad. And for most of us, the status quo isn't that bad either. It seems that the American dream is alive and well. We have our two and a half kids, we have our cars, we have our homes, and we have all of our expensive little toys. And we do all of that using money we haven't earned yet to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. As a culture, we just have zero financial margin in our lives, which means we aren't even living for ourselves. We are just another cog in the financial wheels of the system. And some of us can't remember the last time we didn't have a car payment. We have our houses, but we refinance the mortgage every 10 years to get a lower payment missing the fact that we added another 30 years of payments onto it at the end. We're shackled by our financial commitments. We have zero idea how to live differently in order that we would bring light and life into the world instead of just fueling the consumerism that is so rampant in this world. We have zero margin on our calendars. We have scheduled our time and filled our time with everything from work to entertainment to taking the kids to the next best event. One of our biggest addiction in this world might be just our own busyness. We tie ourselves up in all sorts of ways and we, we are bound up by the things of this world that we are so preoccupied with. We are tied up because we have tied ourselves up. Did you know the average American forfeits nine working days of vacation every year? That's almost two work weeks of vacation all because it's so busy at work. Maybe the first and easiest way to start to loosen the bonds that trap us is just maybe, just maybe, it is using all of our vacation days that we've earned from our employers. Using that time the time of margin in our lives to connect with our families, to connect with ourselves, to connect with God. And stop this idea that we are only valued when we are useful and productive. Maybe it's figuring out our finances so that instead of living a life of paycheck to paycheck or just one serious illness away from bankruptcy, Maybe it is figuring out how to live in a sustainable way that counters the evil in this world. Maybe it's just living differently so that we can just live differently. Maybe instead of tying ourselves up, it is is working with Jesus to bind the strong men of this world, binding the evil forces of this world by calling power to account standing up and calling evil, evil, and marching with the marginalized. It is working to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and walk humbly with our God. And dare I say that that when Jesus says that he wants to save us, 
He not only means saving us from the evil forces of this world, but saving us from ourselves. And later in the Gospel of Mark, it seems that the strong man that Jesus had tied up and plundered has gotten loose. That strong man is taking his revenge on the Holy One who had plundered his world by casting out the powers of destruction that were his prized possessions and the evil forces working through Judas and the religious establishment. The evil forces working through the mob and the Roman oppressors have robbed Jesus of his life. And then they put him in a tomb thinking that his plundering is over on that Friday night. But Sunday is a coming. And Jesus is the ultimate thief. Even in death, Jesus plunders the gates of hell and in the resurrection frees us all to live unbounded lives, free to live and free to love and free to walk humbly with our God. And when Jesus opened his arms on the cross, he opened them to us all. And be assured that no matter what comes, Nothing will separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus. Amen.